that public declaration that only the World Championship would be good enough for Ferrari this year, Jean Tote set his team in pursuit of the toughest goal in motorsport at the unveiling of its 1998 challenger, the F300. There's no doubt that this was a much better looking car than the critics of the new rules had expected, though it's visibly narrower by about a hand's width each side and was shown clean, without barge boards or any other aerodynamic add-ons, so probably it isn't the final execution. Unique on the Formula One grid, Ferrari is the only team to produce its own engines as well as everything else, which also means this is the season's biggest budget. The rule changes, inspired primarily by safety concerns, mean the cars will have less mechanical grip and less aerodynamic downforce, setting the designers a number of challenges with the big emphasis on aerodynamics. It was no coincidence that Ferrari's unveiling was conducted with the new wind tunnel facility at Marinello as a dramatic backdrop. The mood at Marinello was confident and upbeat. Everyone concerned was unanimous in saying that the team now has a complete package with which to fight for the title on equal terms with any other team. New car, a new gearbox, a, a new engine, a new type of tyres, so it will be very challenging. Uh, a minimum external dimension of the front of the chassis, as well as a minimum internal dimension. So the front of the car looks much uh, squarer. The track is obviously much narrower, you can see that the wheels have been brought in. The cockpit opening is probably not so clear, uh, there's some changes there in the regulations. Obviously the groove tyres, and there's a much bigger crash structure on the side of the car to comply with the new side impact test. I mean, it's a consistent development where we build it up over, over three years uh, now. The, the success I hope we're going to have this year. We missed out certain people who uh, were able to do the last step and we got them from last year, but last year they weren't able to build the car. Now it's a, it's a full uh, car built by, by Ferrari themselves with all the people together in one direction and uh, I think that's going to be our strength. Schumacher's penalty for the controversial incident with Villeneuve was to help the FIA's road safety campaign. The double world champion will be under enormous scrutiny this year from both the world's press and the Tifosi, who will do anything to get a glimpse of the famous red cars. Holding out to the last possible moment, McLaren was the last big team to show its new car for 98, unveiled at a low-key technical briefing at Woking. This is Adrian Newey's first work for the McLaren team after joining a year ago at a salary rumoured to be around $2 million. Big bucks in an era where most other teams, and especially Williams, are insisting that car design now is so complex and intricate that no one man can do the whole job unless it's a team effort. Well, obviously, we're hoping that this will be a year in which we win a lot of races and challenge for both the Drivers' and Constructors' Championship. But as we speak here, it's, it's very difficult to know exactly just how competitive it will be. And there's one thing that's for sure, it's impossible to go better than our start to the season we had in Melbourne last year. So I think, as, as we speak now, if I could start the year with a few points and maybe a podium, then that would be a positive run. The rest of the pit lane will be breathing a sigh of relief as they look at this car and find nothing that indicates Newey has found a secret fix for the loss of grip and downforce and grip imposed by the new rules. Although he's alone in continuing low nose from last year's car as everyone else has gone higher. But none of that means McLaren can be ruled out of the equation. In fact, the reverse is probably still true of the team, which ended last year with what looked like the best all-round package. And they bring that same completeness to the party again this year, with the added bonus of the new design from Newey and another new V10 engine from Ilmore. I think the performance, what we did uh, last year, and what the team did in particular, uh, was extremely good. And uh, I understand people obviously, obviously expecting us to do even better this year. 
The new car has already passed the crash test for what Ron Dennis described as the most stringent set of technical regulations for a racing car yet devised. And that accounts for its slab-sided look, but perhaps not for the boxed-off diffuser invisible at the launch. This year is a, a, a very uh, demanding year, very stringent structural requirements for this, for, for, for this year's car and uh, it's been a big challenge to meet those requirements but we're very comfortable with the performance uh, level that we've reached in our wind tunnel. Uh, we put nearly 12,000 hours of uh, work into the aerodynamics of the car and uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing uh, that bear fruit on the circuit. The McLaren's engine is badged as Mercedes, but designed and built by Ilmore Engineering, whose formidable record of success in the IndyCar series has yet to be matched in Formula One. But as last year's very powerful V10 is replaced by a newer and more reliable unit, this could be the season that it's all changed. Uh, engineers has, has seen an enormous effort again to improve the efficiency of the engine in terms of power and fuel consumption and the weight, reliability, uh, revs, and name it. These are many, many different things what the engineer has been really working hard this winter to develop the engine to be even better than last year. And certainly they have made uh, significant improvements for the engine, what we, will, what we will see this year. In fact, the announcement of a new Mercedes unit was greeted with a chorus of dismay by the rest of the pit lane and might account for some of the smiles at Woking. Mercedes has done a great job on the engine. We've done a lot of work on their transient dyno, so we're confident about uh, engine and gearbox reliability. And uh, now we just have to see, uh, as we've married up those uh, factors into the new car with its new aerodynamics, we'll have to see if it does the job. But um, uh, I believe um, confidence in situations like this is a weakness, not a strength and uh, we're just taking a level-headed approach to the future and uh, if we've done our homework well, then we'll get the results. With aerodynamic downforce and mechanical grip limited by the rules, or at least that was the intention, it looks likely that this will be a year when horsepower could make the difference between just winning races or winning the world title. It also seems that McLaren is everybody's favourite in this pre-season period, which does impose a burden on them as well. We know people expect a lot from us. Um, we can look back on the winter and say it's hard to imagine how we could have tried harder. It's been a fine balance. Uh, of uh, research and development versus production versus testing. Um, we've completed 8,000 kilometers of testing uh, with Bridgestone. We're very happy with the performance of the tyres. But anyone expecting the first race in Melbourne to provide a snapshot of the new season's form book might do well to remember last year's Australian Grand Prix. Well, I think that uh, Melbourne last year we had a first place and a third place and as you know at the end of the, the year as you mentioned we had a, a first and a second so it, it all looked quite positive but there's so much work that we have to do and it's uh, because of regulation change if anything it will be more competitive even closer between some of the teams so I think that at the moment the, the pressure lies more on, on the Williams or on the Ferrari to perform. The car shown here in McLaren Orange will race throughout the season in the silver livery of Mercedes, but under Mercedes' own definition must win races before it can join the ranks of the Silver Arrows. Last year's car won for Coulthard at the start of the year and Hakkinen at the end. Whether or not that can be improved on remains to be seen. Jordan in particular, the new season will bring more than just new rules. It's year one of an engine deal with Mugen, a move widely seen as the first step on the road back to Formula One by the Honda factory, once the dominant force in Formula One. And there's more as Ralph Schumacher gets a new partner in the shape of 1996 Formula One world champion, Damon Hill. 
Hill took his number one plate to Arrows last season as Eddie Jordan put his faith in young guns, but he knows the value of having a proven winner in the team. He has won 21 races, he's a world champion, so he has a proven record. And what we needed from him was to guide us as a team who hasn't won a world championship or in fact Grand Prix races. We need him to guide us through that. And whether it's him or whether it's Ralph Schumacher next year, you know, I won't be concerned as to who it is. I just want to be sure that it can happen. And um, the blend between the experienced old pro and the up and coming superstar uh, is a particularly exciting aspect that I'm looking forward to. How it works, I have no idea. Silverstone, the almost universal testing base for British Formula One teams, and they don't get much more British than this. The Jordan team has grown into one of the pit lane's major players in just a few years, complete with its own wind tunnel, a factory engine deal, and a big budget sponsor to go with them, or rather vice versa. In addition, they had the most British of British drivers as well. 1996 world champion Damon Hill. In between teams at this test, and unable to test for either of them because of contractual contradictions. <laughs> that limited his contribution to one of very well-informed observer. One quite able to make helpful suggestions as the day went by, but obviously frustrating for him. I've got to get back in the swing of things. I haven't driven a car since uh, Jerez, which is uh, um, uh, October last year. And, uh, and I want to get going to learn about the team, learn about the car, and get ourselves in good shape for, um, for uh, Melbourne. Last year, Jordan lavished the big books on a wind tunnel and one or two of the more high-tech gadgets so essential to Formula One's success and put his trust in the glory hunger of his two young drivers. That was ultimately a frustrating decision for him on more than one occasion when it was clear that the car had the potential to grab the opportunist podium spots and the drivers were keen enough to be within striking distance. But somehow it never quite gelled. Eddie Jordan is sure that an experienced winner like Hill could have pulled it off. Well, I think uh, I have to learn a lot from him, and I, I'm able to learn a lot, whether I do or not is, is on me, on myself. But I think we have a very good relationship, and um, I don't see any problem at all. And my, I mean, one thing is sure, Damon is the guy this, for this season who is going to win the races, and maybe as well going for a good place in championship and I just see that I learn as much as possible from him. A winning team. The media at large and the British media in particular would all like to think that because Damon Hill was locked in a two-year championship battle with Michael Schumacher and because Ralph is Michael's brother there must automatically be some kind of animosity between the two drivers. There should always be competition between teammates, of that there is no doubt. And some teams and team managers set out to foster that air of uneasiness in the hope that both drivers will be spurred on to greater things. Others believe that it's better if the two drivers work together in testing and when qualifying and choosing race setups. And we saw last year how teammates can help each other during the race. Whichever way you look at it, all drivers will tell you that the driver they want to beat most of all on any grid is their own teammate, because that's the ultimate yardstick of ability, another driver given identical equipment and opportunity. Damon Hill is 37 years old and that makes him the senior driver in Formula One this year. As a proven race winner and world champion, he clearly does have the experience and knowledge necessary to make a car that is capable of winning races cross the line first. Ralph Schumacher, on the other hand, may lack the experience, but he ought to be fitter and stronger and have quicker reflexes. Between them and working together, they should be able to put Jordan in the winner's circle this year.
Blitziot's party in the Formula One launch season was in London's Royal Albert Hall as Jordan took the wraps off the car, which might then make this eighth season in Formula One as much of a milestone as the first. Never afraid to upset the status quo, Eddie Jordan has innovated his way up the F1 ladder ever since he arrived in 1991 with the pretty green 191. And as we've seen, this season has all the ingredients to be his best ever. Adding to last year's expenditure on its new wind tunnel, the team has joined forces with Mugen Honda in a move which is widely seen as Honda's first steps on the road back to full-time presence in Formula One. Recalling the 80s when Honda, Williams and McLaren ruled the roost from green light to checkered flag. With Hill and Honda in the Albert Hall plus the performers from the Cirque du Soleil, the atmosphere was upmarket to say the least. And if there is a psychological advantage to be gained from having the launch of the season, there's no doubt Jordan has it. The firm's CV looks good as well. Gary Anderson now has the tools to deliver his full potential, and the engine should help the car do the same. On paper, this looks very good for all concerned. Perhaps this won't be a make or break season, but a vital season just the same. I felt that Ralph and Giancarlo, um, two outstanding young drivers, um, but at the very central, you know, their, their career paths were right on top of each other, and I think the natural progression or the natural growth would be impeded. So um, it was quite without doubt if I had the opportunity to get Damon Hill, which we definitely did have, and made sure that I didn't lose him in the second year. Um, that he could be of massive valuable assistance to us inside, both commercially, technically. But he will be a big asset to Ralph in particular. Because, to be honest, Ralph is perhaps, in one respect, not expected to beat him because he's a world champion initially. After all, Ralph is only 22 and in his second full season of Formula One. But if he does beat him, of course, it's a big boost for him. And I think the two of them will actually get along real fine together. They're both committed to beating Michael and I think there's no greater carrot for either driver than, than that. Last year, Damon Hill turned down Jordan and went to Arrows, and it was a bleak year for the defending world champion, despite a fighting sixth place at Silverstone and an excellent drive in Hungary. Now, with a team that's six years further down the development road, there may be more to enjoy in 98 for Damon Hill. And I want to say a big thank you to them. I think I like the style of Eddie Jordan. I think that um, the one thing about him is he, his, his, in, his enthusiasm infects everyone in the team. And it really is Eddie Jordan's team and I'm very, very happy to be part of it. I like the, the feeling I've got so far. Um, he, but he, you know, above all, he wants to win and so does everyone else and so do I. You can see the professionalism there. Yeah, he, he knows what he wants and he knows that he's going to get there. Um, I don't think there's anyone that would say that Eddie Jordan isn't going to get what he wants eventually. As we've seen, Hill's arrival at Jordan puts him alongside Ralph Schumacher, sometime wayward brother of Michael, and so far the only one of the two drivers to have sampled the new car. Even the engine was very good to start with, and so I'm quite confident. Well, that was really just strange circumstance, half wet, half dry, so there was nothing major wrong with it. It felt quite good, but I can't say how good it is. That will be decided by decided by Damon really on Wednesday in Barcelona when he's testing, then we see his first impression. Maybe the most significant part of the new package is the Mugen engine. Never short on horsepower, famed for reliability, it should give the team a strength in an area that was weak last year. Well, the engine is a complete new engine for this year. Um, when we got involved with them in, in July of last year, we wanted a lot of changes done to the engine to actually modify it to suit our belief of how the engine should go in the car because it's, a, it's an integral part. It's not just an engine in a car anymore. And that's where I think Renault and Williams have won in the last while because they've, you know, they've been a team together and it, they, they recognise it's an integral part. And uh, Honda were, were able to stand up and respond very, very well and did the things that we wanted to do. Um, the engine's running very well, I'm very pleased with it. Um, test bed figures are, are very strong. Um, it's lighter than last year's engine, the centre of gravity is lower than last year's engine, so all in all, I think it's quite a reasonable package. The buzzword for 98 is packaging. A good driver, engine or chassis is no longer enough on its own. It has to be part of a coherent whole. 
the package. I'm just saying that we've never been in a position to get a better package than we already have at this moment. The package we have is quite outstanding and uh, um, the addition of Benson and Hedges, uh, all of the different sponsors that I mentioned today, it, it, it has given us a new impetus, a new meaning and, and I think we have things now that we can afford. We've got the top drivers, we've got a great test team, got a lovely car and a great engine. I mean you couldn't possibly ask for a better package than that. All teams approach every new season with high hopes. There is every reason to suppose that on this occasion, Jordan's optimism is well founded. The Williams team were testing a 97 and a half car in Jerez, while work on the actual 98 car, the FW20, continued back at the factory. This test of a narrow track FW18 was as close as world champion Jacques Villeneuve had yet come to a car built to beat the new rules which come into effect this season. Already widely quoted as a critic of the new rules, after having driven a car very like this hybrid version of his title winning car, Villeneuve found very little to change his mind after putting miles under his belt. Of course, test miles in this sort of car won't answer questions about the form book for the coming season, when so many other things have changed beside track and tyres. But it'll give the team a good idea about tyre wear, for example, and the way that the car is likely to perform as the tyre wears down and the grooves slowly disappear. There's a case for believing that groove tyres may cause the cars to tramline, follow seams and lines in the tarmac, or to squirrel out of terms under hard acceleration. In any case, the compounds are harder because of the grooves, and that means the cars are running out of traction and grip earlier than they would otherwise. So all the drivers need to put as many laps as they can before the start of the first race in order to get the feel for the way the cars built to the new rules are going to behave. team were trying to get an idea about how fast the new tyres will wear away. Aside from basic considerations of keeping their cars in the race, they also have to deal with the rulebook, which says that there's a limit to how much tyre wear there can be on what is essentially a treaded tyre. Though the FIA has yet to explain its own interpretation of that rule, the teams must still have their own data on rates of tyre wear. Silverstone again and a very cold, bright morning at the end of January. The media is out in force though. This is probably the most significant launch of the pre-season period as Williams take the wraps off the car in which Jacques Villeneuve will defend his driver's world championship. With Frensen again, his running mate, he'll be supported by two test drivers as Max Wilson joins one Pablo Montoya on the test team although both will be anxious to prove their worth and earn a graduation into full-time racing. The launch was a typically Williams affair. No Spice Girls, no glamour, just a fast racing car was how the team summed it up, with the promise that it would be running later in the day, something that seemed a tall order in view of the fact that the car wasn't ready to leave for Silverstone until 7.30 this morning. But there it was. Higher nose, torsion bar suspension, and displayed at a fixed angle because Williams didn't want anyone to study the rear end too closely, where the exhaust exit onto the top of the rear diffuser, an approach widely regarded as conservative. So perhaps we all missed something important. The unmistakable difference is, of course, the new livery. Rothmans ends a very successful four-year association with Williams and Winfield Racing becomes title sponsors of the FW20. Williams believe they are the team to beat this year, but without Adrian Newey and without Renault, Villeneuve could be the biggest asset in their lineup. The coming season will be a very tough time indeed for Villeneuve and the team. 
they haven't kept the number one plate since Rosberg, and this is the first time he will defend a title, having left IndyCar as champion to join Williams in Formula One, and keeping a crown can be harder than winning it. But Villeneuve is highly motivated, although you can be forgiven for not noticing it. His performance at the press conference was in line with the rest of the team. Low-key, almost laid back, not promising victories or success, but quite insistence that they have the right package. Well, it looks very nice, but uh, it doesn't matter how it looks. Uh, you know, I like it only when I find out that it's fast. Uh, Look, looking at the data, the numbers, uh, and you know, speaking with the designer, the aerodynamicist and all that, it should be a very good car. Uh, usually the Williams uh, are very quick out of the box, but you know, a mistake can happen. Uh, but all in all, I'm very confident in the car being fast. Though McLaren could be the biggest threat, it's hard to make predictions. Well, the only, the only one I'm sure that is going to be a competition is Heinz Harald, my teammate, because he's going to be in the same car. Um, Michael and Ferrari should be quick, they're always at least quick, so they, they, they should be competitive. Uh, McLaren should be competitive also, then all, all the other ones, we'll just have to wait and see. Brenson is facing a tough season. He won his first Grand Prix last year, but he knows he must deliver consistent results. Yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult, but uh, expecting, regarding uh, my performance at Williams, I want to do better than last year. I had my learning year with Williams last year. I, I learned about the technique, I learned about people, and now I want to use the chances I, I have for next year. With the rule book written as tightly as the FIA can make it, there's little room for designers to manoeuvre, and the cars do tend to look very similar so there's little chance of finding a big surprise on the Melbourne grid. Now it tends to be more um, iterative, tiny step developments, uh, but every now and then one's surprised by something and they, they, they make a, what, what we consider as a dramatic step is a 1% improvement now, whereas um, one was disappointed 15 years ago when you didn't find 5% every week. Today is the day the team will find out how much they've lost compared to last year. The new rules will make the car slower, and it's only a question of how much. Though this will not be the most significant test of the new car, it will underline a number of basic points. William chose today to unveil and said that it would run. Even though it wasn't finished until a few hours ago, they were preparing it to run and prove the point. And that will make a fairly strong statement about just how prepared they are for the new season and just how strong the team is and how deeply that strength extends. Just how early they are in the scheme of things is evident as the seat is trimmed to fit Villeneuve into the car which he's just been reminding everyone upstairs in the press conference is going to be very quick out of the box. That will be a show of strength if the car runs strongly as soon as it's fired up, but that's not enough to win the championship, nor even to win races. In fact, running strongly, in other words, engine horsepower, is probably going to be the toughest part of the programme this year. Though Adrian Newey has been in charge of design at McLaren, he hasn't been in charge here at Williams since the end of 1996, and both Frank Williams and Patrick Head are confident that Gavin Fisher and Jeff Willis, who worked with him until his departure, have taken up the challenge very well. As Frank Williams said, they did a good job in 97, and he expects 98 to be no different. But the engine may be a different story. Ford, Ferrari and Mercedes have new power plants for this year. And while all three take advantage of the opportunity to repackage for the new rules, they'll doubtless also be more powerful than before. While horsepower is a grey area that no one wants to go into too deeply, it's possible that the Mechachrome units are faster than last year, but they're basically the same. 
while that might give them an edge on reliability, it might also leave them trailing the other three from the word go. And there's no way of knowing whether Mechachrome will be able to maintain the pace of development the others will definitely sustain. As Frank said, we'll have to wait and see. Next of the season's new look cars to appear in public was the Stewart Ford, which will be driven by Jan Magnussen and Rubens Barrichello. The changes due for the start of this year were no surprise, and early last year, not long after initial design work had started on the new chassis for 98, Ford and Cosworth decided this would be the ideal moment to make fundamental changes to the ZTEC V10 engine. As the engine and chassis designs progressed along the same timeline, it provided a perfect opportunity for both sets of designers to collaborate very closely on lowering the center of gravity, reducing overall width and improving airflow, an essential approach to the overall philosophy in order to claw back as many of the disadvantages as the new rules have brought. Unveiled at Ford's Engineering Research Centre at Dunton in the UK, the SF2 is the second all-new Grand Prix car the Stewart team has produced in its two-year history. A tall order for any team, but massively steep for a new team. Designer Alan Jenkins pointed out the obvious truth. It would have been much easier for the team to have run a development version of last year's SF1. But the new rules mean there's virtually no carryover from last year, apart from minor items of running gear. That placed a huge demand on the resources of Formula One's youngest team still in its first season, making the achievements of Monaco and Montreal seem even more significant when viewed in that context. Now with engine and chassis design proceeding hand in glove, the new Ford ZTEC powered SF2 should be a fully rounded package for the upcoming season. But even so, no one at Stewart expects this coming season to be any easier. If anything, they're preparing for it to be even harder. Historically, in fact, no new team has had an easy time in its second year, a fact which Jackie Stewart has not overlooked, and he too expects year two to be even more difficult for the new team than year one. We are a new team. We're not a small team, but we are new. We don't have the resources, either financially or in human terms, that the big teams have. So we've struggled to get it ready this early. But on the other hand, we felt as if we needed to because we'll have to test sometime in January and also in February. And, you know, people seem to forget we've got to be in Australia by uh, the weekend of the 8th of March. So there isn't much time. This year, every team in the pit lane will need every tiny advantage it can scavenge from a rule book which is set out to reduce downforce and mechanical grip, cutting cornering speeds and adding seconds to every lap. Well, I don't know yet. I've been, I drove the, the groove tires with a, with a white car and then I drove the narrow car with the normal rain tires because it was raining when I went to Barcelona. So it's, it's hard to know. Uh, it's less grip, so you have to be very smooth. We smooth with the throttle as well when you're trying to, to put the power down. So it's, it's, it's going to be a, a different mixture. You have to, to be more smooth anyway. Some say that starting from a clean sheet of paper this year will level the playing field between the big teams and the smaller ones. But the wise council holds that big budgets and resources will always have an advantage over smaller ones, even though Stewart is well-funded and well-supported. I think the new engine is going to help us. I think we're unquestionably going to be more reliable than we were last year. And I think... Our aim is now to be regular top 10 runners, both in qualifying and racing, and therefore to get into the top six, at least to pick up more than double digits or 10 points in the Constructors and Drivers World Championships. Every team has been working flat out in testing, looking for every scrap of improvement over their wind tunnel cars. 
but previous experience indicates that big teams with big budgets and big resources will find their baseline quickest and be able to make steady improvements in the car concurrently with their race program. Little teams like Stewart won't be able to keep up. Nineteen ninety eight will be Benetton's first year under new leadership. The B198 looks even less like last year's car than most interpretation of the new rules by other teams resemble their actual predecessor. There are plenty of changes here, young drivers and a customer engine in Nick Worth's first Benetton, plus a dramatic last-minute switch to Bridgestone tyres are among the early hallmarks of that new hand on the controls. Compatriot of last year. I want to build a team that sort of really has that sense of purpose about it. I want a team of people that really believe in themselves and can see a long-term future. Uh, because I think fundamentally if you give people that stability, you give them the direction, uh, results will follow us um, in due course. Typical positive thinking from Dave Richards, which rally fans have long been accustomed to. It's also the basic philosophy behind the switch away from Goodyear. Richard wants committed winners on the team, putting their effort behind a new car that's a lot more different to last year's than it looks. Yeah, the design philosophy of this car was really, firstly, to extend our, our use of technology forward a little bit, uh, use of materials, use of manufacturing techniques, while at the same time finding the new compromises that are required uh, for the new regulations. You must bear in mind that design always is a compromise and those compromises can change as regulations change. So our goals have been to, to find that compromise and then having got a good layout for the new rules to actually exploit our technology as best we can to produce the best car we possibly can. The Benetton driver lineup is made up of young lions, rather like Jordan's last year, the similarity made even more startling thanks to the presence of Giancarlo Fischichella, yet another Eddie Jordan protégé. Benetton team is a very good team. Maybe it's the best uh, with Williams, McLaren and Ferrari. Uh, we have got a very good car. I have uh, one more year of experience. Um, I finished second last year, the, my best position. I would like to improve this position. Already an outstanding figure in the paddock, Alexander Wurtz is even more noticeable thanks to his lucky boot superstition, which he carries into his first full season in Formula One. I have to take it and I have to go for it because uh, always I was streaming from Formula One. Now I have the, the possibility to be, I'm contracted to a, a top team to Mile 7 Benetton Formula. And that's a, that's a nice position and now we have to just uh, keep on working like, like I did, always concentrated on the car, on the technique side. And then uh, for me the, the season can start. The team goes into the season with a customer engine from Mechachrome, a revision of last year's Renault power plant, which must compete with brand new V10s from Ferrari, Ford, Honda and Mercedes. So it could be a weak link in the chain. Viennese Castle, a specially written musical symphony and a collection of odd-looking classical dancers provided the backdrop to the launch of the C17, a car which Peter Sauber hopes will provide podium finishes on a more than haphazard basis for his Swiss-based team. At least that's the stated goal. Even with a set of new rules for everyone, it's hardly realistic for any team with only a handful of podiums under its belt to start talking about race victories this year. But these days, it's the thing to talk yourself down rather than up. But it's worth considering that only three teams will start this season with a driver pairing in which both halves have already won Grand Prix, Williams, McLaren and Sauber.
Furthermore, this is clearly not a team that's struggling with budget. Forget about the over-the-top launch party. Just looking at the car, it's easy to see that under Leo Reese's design, the team has had every opportunity to give it all the attention to detail that you'd like. Salba starts 1998 with a supply of Petronas badged Ferrari engines that are quick and reliable, continuing last year's happy and successful relationship. Everyone is asking if Alesi can help Salba win, but they might be better asking if Salba can help Alesi win. So far, just one victory on his CV, and he's better known for running out of fuel last year than winning Montreal in 95. The challenge is uh, uh, the possibility to, to improve the results of uh, a team who are working in Formula 1 now since uh, uh, six years, I think. And they, uh, they have a good budget, they have uh, everything ready to do it. Just uh, maybe what they need is two drivers pushing on the same direction to make a, a real improvement, a real uh, collaboration with a uh, with chief designer. John Alesi remains the biggest enigma in the pit lane. Fast and talented in Formula 3000, he showed all the right assets while driving for Tyrrell. But they were submerged in the fiasco at Ferrari, and he left for Benetton just as Ferrari cleaned up its own act. Now he's moved on again, insisting once more that the change is for the better. But on the other hand, Johnny Herbert had what many people thought was a best ever season last year. Although with new rules changing the way the cars drive, perhaps this season won't be a logical continuation of that. Early days, but Herbert definitely noticed a difference in this run at Fiorano. Well, it's, it's very difficult to compare. There's a big, big difference because obviously they had the, the slicks last year and the grip is completely different now, uh, especially at this type of track like we have here in Fiorano. It's uh, a very high grip track and you you benefited much, much more from the slick tyres. So uh, <clears throat> you've lost a lot of grip. The braking is much, much worse here. The traction, a lot of wheel spin um, and generally quite twitchy. So uh, they're sort of much more difficult to drive. Last year, progress was slow, if not completely absent. Herbert qualified well in the early races, but as other teams improved, Salba got no better and consequently moved backwards on grids and lap charts. Now, Alacy and Herbert should make a good job of getting the C17 to the podium more often, an aim set against Peter Salba's long-term goal, winning races by the year 2000. It's an all-French affair as Peugeot combined with Prost to produce the AP01. Olivier Panis and Jarno truly are the driving force. The introduction of a revolutionary carbon fibre gearbox has given the team problems in early testing, but were now said to be resolved. Team boss Alain Prost is confident of the team's prospects. But what is the most important is, uh, is uh, we know that the objective is to be in, uh, between the top teams as quick as possible and uh, the, the objective would be to try to be there this year already. Yeah. The stunning Black Arrows A19, designed by John Barnard, is powered by its own engine, making the Tom Walkinshaw operation only the second team together with Ferrari to build its own power plant. We decided that instead of wasting the money just renting engines from someone, we would invest it and uh, build our own and hopefully get industry support for it. Pedro Daniers is joined by Mika Salo. I was really happy when uh, Tom wanted me to drive for him because uh, I know his reputation in racing and uh, He's got John Barnard designing a car, so it was just everything what I wanted. Thirty years ago, when the King's Road in Chelsea was synonymous with swinging England, a dashing young race driver from Scotland formed an alliance with Ken Tyrrell and Ford, and their success was part of an era of optimism, which established Tyrrell as one of the top teams in Formula One. A collection of world championships with Stewart, a season of glory in the late 80s with a DFV against the turbo cars and a revolutionary six-wheeler which won a Grand Prix of the moments in Tyrrell history which are best remembered. 
along with Harvey Parcel Waits, an hedral front wing on the 018, and John Alesi's stunning drive in a car that seemed to have been made for him. This may be a farewell to Formula One for the pit lane's favourite boffin, the Ford-powered 026, possibly his last piece of penmanship, at what is most definitely the end of an era. Times change and the posh King's Road address that once housed Campbell's assault on the world speed record is now a smart new cafe, complete with espresso machines and canapes. Assisted by TV glamour girl Denise Van Alten, Ken Tyrrell unveiled eventually the last Formula One car to bear his name, marking the end of an era which has lasted 31 years. The design team feels that the new car is fairly well settled, though there'll be detail changes through the season, probably in the area of the front wing. The rear wing and retention of Tyrrell's trademark X-wings are unlikely to alter much, if at all. The big talking point is that this season seems to be much more of an open book than any season in the recent past. And that supposedly gives small teams with clever design and a strong package the chance to shine against the big budgets. It, it won't be a two-horse race for the championship in 1998. There'll be probably three or four teams involved, you know, and uh, so I think it will be a very interesting season. Good chance for Tyrrells on the podium? Yeah, I think so. I think that uh, well, a, a lot will depend on, on who the other driver is, of course, uh, and we obviously we would like to have an experienced driver. Um, uh, it, it, it's hard to expect a new boy coming into Formula One to, to finish in the first six in his first year these days, um, it, it's a long time since that happened, but uh, we shall see. So far, there's no news about a second driver who'll take over the other 026, though it may yet be Joss Verstappen. This car spent 30% longer in the wind tunnel than last year's car, and the width reduction has made it possible to design a car which is more efficient in terms of its lift-to-drag ratio than previously. When you start narrowing the track of the car, it changes all the aerodynamics a little bit. I mean, it depends. There are those people who want to see huge and radical changes, but these cars already are starting to look quite a lot different in detail to the way they looked last year. Um, the side pods have got much longer because of the side impact regulation. Um, and and the, 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 the narrow front track will change the design of the front wing, the layout of the end plates. Uh, and so I expect we'll see, we, I expect as the cars are presented, we'll see them all looking different to last year, but maybe a little quite similar to each other. Like other designers who've spoken about their new cars this year, Harvey Postlesweight believes that most of the missing downforce has been recaptured. Unlike most of them, he won't now get the chance to refine the 026 for 1999, nor will Ken Tyrrell. I haven't uh, thought of it. In, in that way actually I've really thought about it in that this is our last year then let's get our finger out and let's get on and and try and get some good finishes. Next year Tyrrell becomes British American Racing headed by Craig Pollock and under the design leadership of Adrian Reynard and the Ockham workshops will close their doors forever. Brazilian Ricardo Rosset has joined to partner Takagi. Since entering Formula One, Minardi have shown resilience and determination in their bid to compete at the top level. The Italian team looked at various drivers, including Dane Tom Christiansen, before taking on Argentine rookie Esteban Tuero and Prost outcar Shinji Nakano, who struggled last year. Minardi know it's a difficult road ahead, but are hoping 1998 is the year they turn the corner. <laughs>